the land. They're both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have had for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that awesome acknowledgement of country, Adi, and thanks for everyone for coming along today. I'm Alana and this is Ella. And we are just two of the members of the Surf Coast Youth for Climate group. Surf Coast Youth for Climate is an environmental group with passionate and enthusiastic young people living here in the Surf Coast. Since the start of the year, we've been meeting once a week to work up to this event by engaging in workshops and learning useful techniques. As a team, we've put together this event to educate and inform our community about living sustainably. Please enjoy and once again, thank you for coming and showing all your support. I'll now hand it over to Connor. Thanks Alana and Ella for that introduction. I'm Connor from Surf Coast Youth for Climate and today I'll be introducing to you James McLennan from Grassroots Sustainability who will be talking to you about composting and growing fruits and vegetables in your garden. Awesome, thank you very much, uh, Connor. It's um, lovely to be here tonight uh, for this, yeah, this amazing um, event. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the, the Surf Coast Youth for Climate for putting this on. It's a, it's a fantastic um, event. So very, very happy to be a part of it. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, a topic which is which is close to my heart um, and it's it's a big problem in our current day society and in Australia particularly. Um, so I'm talking about um, food waste. So food food matters and um, that's the title of my topic and it, it matters on a number of levels. It matters where we get it from, it matters um, where it's grown, how it's grown, um, what sort of you know, what's treated with it, um, where we buy it from. Do we buy it directly from the farmer? Do we buy it from a supermarket? Um, there, there's so many things that, that matter about food, um, the packaging, the, the, the food miles, how, how far it's traveled. Um, but tonight I am looking at, at that food waste and that organic waste um, that we talk about and the problem that's associated with it. This is a, this is a massive problem. And we're talking about climate change. Um, and yet a lot of people don't actually associate this problem with climate change. Yet it's, it's a problem that costs Australians so much every year. Um, in fact, around $20 billion um, of the Australian economy goes towards food waste each year. Um, so financially, yeah, it's, it's a big problem. In fact, that equates to around um, $3,800 uh, per household each year. Okay, so it's, it's an expensive problem we've got. But even more than that, it's, it's an environmental issue. It's, it's, it's causing a greenhouse gas, okay? It's causing methane, which is actually 42 times worse than what carbon dioxide is um, when it's going into our atmosphere. So it's, it's a big environmental issue too. Um, there's, like, if, if we look at this problem holistically and go, right, well, there is so much methane being given off from um, food waste each year, it's actually the equivalent if we took one in every four cars off the road in Australia. So it's, it's a big um, comparison in that sense. And it happens everywhere. It's happening in my house uh, to a certain degree. It's happening in your house. It's happening, it's happening everywhere in, in a lot of other houses on a, on a much larger scale, but it's also happening on the farms as well. It's happening at the supermarkets. It's happening all over the place. So if we look at our, our own rubbish bins, on average in Australia, around 50% of our general waste is actually organic material, okay, which is, which is massive. Our wheelie bin, we think of our wheelie bin and it's, it's, it's half of that every, every week going out on the streets, getting picked up and getting taken to landfill. Now, that to me, as a, as a, as a gardener, as, a, as a, um, a person who's passionate about this issue, that's actually nutrients going from our, our property and being wasted, okay? So it's, this is available nutrients. So when it, when it gets to landfill as well, we, we sort of just chuck it away and that's it. This is, this is for all of our waste. Um, so it's, it's about knowing the process of what happens. So generally land, landfill is a big hole in the ground. Um, and I'm sure Sally can elaborate more on this later. Um, but it sits there, okay? It's then um, mixed with, so if we're talking food waste, it sits with plastics, it sits with um, metals or any, anything that shouldn't be there. It's, it's sitting in this massive hole in the ground, okay? But unlike a compost bin um, or a worm farm, organic waste doesn't actually break down as it normally would. 
Okay, so it actually sits there for a very, very long time. Organic waste actually needs air, it needs sunlight, um, and it needs weathering to, to assist it breaking down. When it's at landfill, it sits for a long time, it seeps this sludge, and it actually gives off this methane, which is that really toxic gas. Um, so this is an issue, okay? In actual, actual recent times, they've done an archeological dig um, in a landfill in, in the United States, and they've actually found that iceberg lettuces and hot dogs that are 40 years old are still intact and recognizable sitting in this landfill essentially, which is crazy. You, if you see an iceberg lettuce on your bench, like it's shriveled in a, in a, a few days, not that I've ever done that and I don't uh, recommend it, but it's, it, it's, it decomposes so quickly, yet 40 years on, it's still in there. So pretty much any organic material we send to landfill stays there for a long time and is continually giving off that sludge and giving off, um, giving off methane. So it's, it's a massive problem, okay? Well, we've talked lettuces, we've talked hot dogs, but anything. Um, I'm even talking, uh, so paper. Paper, place, uh, paper bags is, is organic material. Um, cardboard boxes, okay, organic material. Um, even hair, hair from the hairbrush um, is organic material, okay? And obviously I've, I've rated my hairbrush um, to, to get that sample tonight. Um, if I look in our compost bin, we've got uh, tea bags. Um, we've got banana peels, we've got avocado. Note, the sticker is not um, organic material. Um, spinach, um, roots, everything. We've got carrot shavings, the works in here. So that's all organic material. And that's what I'm saying, 50% of our um, general waste is, is going to being wasted in landfill, basically. So let's, let's hold it right there. Let's, we, we've talked about the, the, the terrible effects of this, the, the negative impact on it. And tonight I want to flip it and actually talk about the positives because there is a lot of doom and gloom around climate change. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a big thing, but we can actually break it down into smaller issues. And my issue tonight, food matters. Yeah. Food matters. And actually we all matter and we can all make a, a really big difference to this problem. Okay. So I'm talking about this now as a resource, we're going to use this as a resource and actually create amazing things out of it using the power of Worms, okay, so worms are amazing animals. They are, they're phenomenal. They're, they, I think they're pretty um, highly underrated, okay? So I'm talking tonight about composting worms, specifically two types, um, tiger worms and red uh, wigglers as well. So they're in my um, worm farm um, and I'm gonna show you them a bit later on if, if we do have time. Um, so organic waste is a, is a resource. If I'm actually feeding my worms, I can use this to then replace nutrients into my soil um, and into my plants as I'm growing. Okay. I love to garden. I love to spend time in the garden. I love to really work with my soil and, and make healthy soil. If I'm, if I'm a gardener or a farmer and I've got healthy soil, it, it essentially makes healthy plants um, and then healthy people. Okay. So the more we feed to our, um, our soil, the better it is for us. So the, the connection is that, it's, it's, a, it's a massive food cycle, okay, which at the moment is quite broken. We, we buy our, um, our food from the, the shop, uh, we, we eat our food, we chuck it in the bin. That's a linear problem, okay? However, if, if we try and grow our own food, I've got some herbs down here, as you can see, um, or veggies in my garden. If I grow that, I eat that, I then compost that, or I feed it to my chooks, or I put it in the worm um, farm, then I'm re-putting those nutrients back into the soil. It's a constant cycle. It goes round and round. So just by doing a few little things, I'm actually changing what I was talking about before, um, sending that waste to landfill. So worms can, um, a, a few facts about worms. Worms can eat um, up to their own body weight a day in organic waste. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. Like me, I, I eat a lot, but I don't think I can eat my own body weight. Um, they, they basically pull it out and weigh it out. And it turns out to be this amazing stuff here. So this is worm castings. Um, this is just the absolute beautiful, beautiful stuff that um, on your garden soil or dug into, the, into your garden is phenomenal. So this is the stuff that I get out of my worm farm regularly, okay? Um, you can mix it, you can use it as a seed raising mix or a potting mix. You can use it on indoor plants, outdoor plants. It doesn't smell um, disgusting anyway. 
it actually smells quite rich. I've, I've, I've made, not made, but I've, I've got kids to smell this at schools before and some sort of go, oh, it smells like chocolate or it smells sweet, it's beautiful. Um, not knowing what it was. And then I tell them they've just smelled worm poo and they're not too happy, but it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and then this is worm wee. Okay, so it's, it's pretty dark. It looks like a, almost like a bottle of soft drink of some sort that I won't say. Um, but it is amazing liquid fertilizer. So if I was to put this into my watering can, um, dilute it down either five to one or, or 10 to one um, with this and water, it's, it's an amazing foliar spray. We can put it on straight onto the leaves of plants or straight into the soil to basically put the nutrients from my food, from the worms into their wee, into my soil. Okay, so again, healthy soil, healthy plants. So which gets me thinking then, if, if that's the case, if I'm feeding worms one thing, um, they're not gonna have a very balanced diet, okay? But if I'm feeding them lots of different things, they love a balanced diet, um, that's gonna be even more nutrient rich, okay? So we'll get to what, what worms eat a bit later on. Worms, um, not all worms eat food scraps, okay? Composting worms eat food scraps. Earthworms don't like to eat food scraps, okay? So earthworms um, generally eat um, leaf litter, they eat soil, they eat um, roots, um, anything that's sort of decomposing in your ground, they'll eat, okay? Whereas these guys love to eat food scraps, so hence why they're a composting worm. Um, worms are, think of worms like a hipster. Worms, worms actually have a fine beard all over them. Um, they love coffee. Um, and they're really good at creating something new out of old, so like, like a bit of recycling. So they're the ultimate hipster. Um, what's the, the, the largest worm ever discovered was 6.7 metres long. So they're, they're phenomenal. They're hermaphrodites, meaning they've both got male and female um, reproductive systems. Um, they can lay 80 eggs a year. So in, in, a, in a space like that, they can their population grows so quickly, okay? They lay their eggs, which are like tiny little lemons under microscopes. They've got these tiny little worms that, that look like spaghetti. Um, and then they just, yeah, do, do you wonders with, with your reducing your food waste. So all of a sudden we've changed this, this, um, this problem into something really cool, which clearly I'm, I'm quite passionate about. Um, so I might actually show you these guys in action. Okay, so I'm going to do some really fancy camera work here. Um, I'm going to pick up my, my computer and take you over to my to my worms. So, so this is a standard uh, worm farm from a hardware store. Okay, um, now in here there's probably around um, well a few thousand worms at the moment. Now worms like a nice moist environment okay they, they love to have it pretty constantly cool constantly um, damp and moist hence why i've got a hessian bag over the top here um, now if we peel it back and you can already see some worms going crazy here um, they do tend to come out and feed more at night time um, so we've got lots going on i've got a bit of cardboard under there as well they, they love eating the cardboard in fact you can see where they've gone, they're eating it away really, really beautifully. Um, there, there's often shredded paper in here as well. Um, and then if we just peel off some of these castings and things, um, you can see just worms going crazy in there. In fact, like I said before, there's a baby worm. I'm not sure if you can see the tiny little baby worm. It's really hard to see, but I think you can maybe see just on top, there's a white little wriggly thing um, which is a baby worm. So, um, yeah, these guys are right now eating some broccoli, eating some cabbage, um, some potato skins, just converting it into that beautiful, beautiful um, worm castings that I showed you earlier. So if, if we think of the top one, um, the top layer is like their dining room. Um, they, this is the only spot I ever put food, okay? Um, it's they come up here, they eat, um, and then uh, at night time, or sorry, at daytime, they go down, okay? So if I, if I leave the lid off and I leave it open to the light, worms don't like the light, okay? So they'll actually go down into the, um, deep down into the farm and, and sort of protect themselves, okay? So if this is the dining room, next layer is generally um, 
we call it like their lounge room. Okay. They like to lounge there. Um, it's full of castings and that's where I usually get the castings from. Um, the bottom layer is, is their toilet. Um, and that's where the weeds collected. So they, there's a few layers in there. You can add more layers as you go. A worm farm like this costs you about no, no more than 80, $90 to set up completely, including worms. Okay. Um, I got this for $5 from the Anglesey tip. Um, you can often see them really cheaply on, on Gumtree or Marketplace or wherever, um, uh, or on the side of the road for hard rubbish as well. So you can get them and set them up really, really um, easily. Um, and it is a great way, if you think of a, a worms like about this big in a bag, um, can pretty much eat about that a week in, um, yeah, in, in food. So they, they convert it really quickly. Um, they're not actually eating the food though, they actually eat um, the food as it decomposes and it's the bacteria around the food. So, um, so there you go. That is my worm farm. Um, I might move you back to over here. Um, so we talked about, we talked about some of the problems associated with with, um, with, the, with the food waste. And food waste is a massive problem. Um, it's obviously we've got food shortages all around the world. Um, and it's, yeah, to, to think that we are wasting so much food um, that we, we often don't even see, like the, the food that comes to our houses isn't even the start of it, okay? Um, I think it's it, one in every five shopping bags a week in our own homes um, gets, gets wasted, okay? And that's on average in Australia. Um, yet think about all that food along the line in the shops. Okay. It's, it's where, where's that going? It's stuff that can't get sold. It's going into skips. Um, they can't often resell it. So it's, it's going to landfill as well. Um, there's in, in transportation, there's things lost, um, whether it's just from the farm to the shop within Australia, not to mention outside Australia too. Um, it's, it's at the farm as well. Um, so how much of this is actually getting, getting lost along the way? If we think about all the food that's grown globally as well, and in fact, one third of all food grown is it goes to waste every year. Um, so that's a, that's a massive statistic. And think about all the water that's wasted and associated with that as well. So it is a really big problem. I think I might um, leave it there and I might open it up to questions. Um, if, if there are any questions around this topic, which yeah, it's, it's a big one. So if you've, if you've got any questions, if you want to um, unmute and, and ask away, that, that'd be great. I think. Okay, so there's a question. Um, even if you eat out every night and don't use a wheelie bin, the takeaway and restaurants are putting out waste um, food for you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, where, wherever that is, like wherever you go, a restaurant, a takeaway place, a, a food stall, um, there is food waste associated with that all along the line. Like there's, there's this food waste. Um, in fact, generally like a lot of restaurants and becoming less and less, thankfully, um, a lot of restaurants don't have organic waste streams. Um, if you are to go into a number of venues, even, even on the surf coast and say, Hey, do you have an organic waste stream within the restaurant? Some of them will say, yeah, yeah, we give our food to um, the community garden um, or we give our coffee grinds to, you know, whoever. Um, but a lot of them don't actually have the bulk of it for their, for their meats or for their, um, their serviettes, their, um, whatever it may be, they don't have a, an avenue to, to get rid of that um, properly. So it is a really big problem. I think we've got another one. Does the worm farm need to stay in a cool shady area? Yes. Um, so worm farms thrive in cooler shady environments. If I was to leave that out on a, even a sort of a 25 degree day, let's say in direct sunlight, it's going to heat up. Um, so as I said, worms, that's why I've got the Hessian thing over the top, but my worm farm is stored in a, in a constantly shady, um, relatively cool spot always. Um, it's good to monitor it as well um, and basically pour a um, watering can of water over it every now and then. 
um, and that way it also flushes it gets gets all the um, the wee out and and hence why you can get such a beautiful bottle of this stuff as well um, so if I'm putting on say two or three liters a week I might be getting um, three four even five liters of that out as well depending on how often I'm feeding them in terms of that um, what, what they like to eat I generally steer clear of proteins um, so meats um, I, I don't put in there um, of uh, yeah don't don't give them carbohydrates either so pastas or breads so any raw stuff any of the things I said before coffee tea bags hair um, banana skins eggshells crushed up gives them a bit of calcium in their diet um, any raw sort of chopped up finely fruit and veg is fine citrus on a small amount not too much citrus because it is quite acidic um, but they take it all okay they they just it's just a balanced diet is is best and they can handle most things some of those things um, depending on the climate you're in um, they can actually start smelling so things like meats will start smelling and attract flies um, if you get maggots into one of these things it's it's a real problem um, and yeah the so yeah dealing with pests um, is, is, a, is an issue that you need to, to contend with um, but if you feed it the right things this thing doesn't smell okay um, it's so if it's if it's treated well it'll treat you well you can keep it on your balcony you can keep it in a little courtyard even if you haven't got much of a, a yard or a garden um, but you've got a few indoor plants this thing's great all right, I'll keep um, seeing what other questions we've got. So should you go and find worms in the ground ourselves or is there somewhere we should get them from? Good question. So yeah, as I said, earthworms won't um, thrive in this thing at all. Okay, they need to eat just um, the soil, the, the roots, the sort of decaying leaf um, litter, the, the um, lawn clippings and things. Um, so no, don't, don't dig for worms and find it will be very, very slow process. Um, not even the worms out in the road after rain. Okay. So go, you can go to a hardware store. You can actually buy a box of worms, um, either 500 or 2000, um, which is pretty cheap. Um, but the best thing to do is find someone who's got worms. Um, I happily give worms away to people if I know they're going to a good home. So a handful of worms, if you think about it, um, will multiply so quickly. As I said, each one lays about 80 eggs a year. Um, so in no time at all, you have a really healthy, thriving um, worm farm. The other alternative is going to um, somewhere like a, a um, community garden. So we've got amazing community gardens along the surf coast. Um, and yeah, they're, they're often happy to, to give them away, providing you ask first. Okay, so that's, that's where you source your worms from. Alrighty, um, so thanks heaps for that, James. We've got lots of questions coming in, but um, yeah, you'll be able to send us an email after this uh, webinar and we'll be able to get back to you with the answers to those questions. All right. So I'm Griffin Brown, another member of Surf Coast Youth for Climate. Up next tonight, we have Sally Sneddon, who is the coordinator of environmental sustainability at Surf Coast Shire. She'll be giving us a rundown on what actually goes in the recycling bin, as well as some information about what about the four bin system that is being implemented next year. These topics are super important for everyone as they help us continue to keep our environment clean and rubbish free. Take it away, Sally. Thanks for an awesome intro, Griffin. And well done, team. I know a lot of work's gone into tonight. You've done a really awesome job. So thanks for having me along and on the program. Um, thanks, James, too. You've um, covered a little bit of ground and taken a bit of work off my hands talking about um, the reasons why we try and keep organic matter out of our landfill, too. So I'll talk a bit more about that um, later on. But waste and recycling are definitely topics that we get lots of questions about. Um, so I'll answer some of those and I'll leave you at the end with some ways to um, ask further questions or find more info if you've still got questions. Um, so recycling, we know that most people really care about what goes in their bins and they really want to get this right. And that really helps us. If people are putting exactly the right things into their recycling bins, um, it means things are not going to landfill um, and taking up space when they could actually be used as a really valuable resource and recycled and made into something else and used again. Um, but it can be really hard to know sometimes exactly what goes in the recycle bin and it can be really tricky because this changes over time as well. So what goes in your recycle bin depends on um, what the recycling contractor can sort. So it depends on what their machinery is like, what their process is like. So that um, is one of the things that determines 
exactly what we can put in our bins at home. Um, and recycling also depends on the market. So who's gonna buy these um, products once all of the materials are sorted into their separate um, types? Um, unfortunately, Australia um, continues to send quite a lot of um, our sorted recycling overseas. Um, a couple of years ago, um, China, you may have heard, um, introduced a ban on quite a lot of um, different materials that we used to send over to them to, we'd sort them in Australia and then send them as um, sorted materials and they would accept them and then recycle them over there. Um, that's changed a little bit. Um, and thankfully our state government is doing quite a bit of work at the moment, um, putting in place a circular economy policy and um, asking all councils to, to change the way they collect waste um, in townships as well. And that's all to address the problems that we have with recycling and some of the shortages that we have in markets and processing facilities that'll accept all those materials in Australia. So we're gonna see some improvements over time. Um, in the meantime, it's really great if you can help us out by knowing exactly what goes in your recycling bin. So I'm gonna go through some of the common things um, and then I'll talk about some of the things that maybe once were allowed in the recycling bin, but these days, that's not the place for them. So I think paper and cardboard are kind of the easy ones. So in your yellow top recycle bin, you can put in your newspapers. Glossy magazines are okay as well. Um, packaging, cardboard packaging, cardboard um, roll. Um, those things are pretty easy to get into your um, recycling bin and get right. Um, plastic, this is a bit of an interesting category. This is one that's changed a little bit um, and generally depends on your recycling contractor and what they can accept. So at the moment, um, CleanAway, who collects our recycling but also takes it for processing at their facilities in Geelong and around Melbourne as well, they'll take any plastics if they've got a number one to five on them. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, most people know that most products have a little um, triangular symbol on the bottom of them usually um, with a little number inside. So that's the key. So something that's a little bit confusing about recycling plastics especially is that even if it has that triangle with a number, even though it looks like a recycling symbol, it doesn't always mean it can go in your recycling bin. Um, the number inside actually tells us what type of plastic it is. So those are the plastics that need to be sorted out into separate categories at the recycling um, facilities. So we used to, until um, just before Christmas last year, we used to be able to collect plastics that had a number one to seven. Um, now it's only one to five. So again, because of um, the markets and difficulties in processing the plastics that have the number six or seven on them, we can no longer take those. So look on your plastics, have a look inside the triangle and just one to five. So some of those common things that can go in your recycling bin that have the numbers one to five is milk bottles, uh, berry punnets, even the um, kind of soft and a bit more scrunchy um, uh, plastic trays from biscuit um, packets can go in your recycling bin. A couple of things that um, sometimes people aren't sure about, even things like deodorant. So you might think, oh no, that can't go in. But have a look, this one's got a number five on the bottom. So that's okay, that can go into your recycling bin. And even some um, plastic containers, some Tupperware containers. So if they don't have a number, please don't put them in the bin. They will um, be counted as contamination. So they might get mixed into the wrong types of plastics. Um, and then that affects the quality of the plastics once they're all chipped and broken down um, into pellets so that they can be remade into new things. So have a look though, if it's got a number, this one has a number five on it. So it means it can actually go into your recycle bin. So this one's still got some life left in it. I can still keep using this container, but um, at the end of its life, if I can't find a reuse for it, then it actually can go into your recycling bin. Um, metals. So it's another pretty easy category to get right, I think. So things like food cans, drink cans as well. Some people don't realise that um, aluminium foil can also go into your recycling bin. 
So make sure, just give it a bit of a wipe down so it's not, uh, it hasn't got all the cheese or food um, scraps stuck onto it. And if you scrunch it up into a ball about the size of either your fist or at least the size of a golf ball, then that means that the sorting equipment can actually um, detect that as a metallic item and it will sort it out for recycling as well. So especially at Easter time, remember that, remember that one and ball up all of your Easter egg wrappers into a big ball and then into your recycling bin. Uh, and then glass. So any glass jars, any coloured bottles um, can go into your recycling bin. Uh, this one here, it's still got the label on, that's fine, that can go straight in. Just remember to take the lid off though, so the lid is metal, so it can go into your recycle bin, but just keep them separate. So this is the trick with any materials that might have two types of materials um, together, holding one product. So glass and metals are both recyclable, just separate them, put them into your recycling bin. So those are the things that can go into your recycle bin. Some of the things that can be a bit confusing that can't go into your recycle bin or may have once been accepted but are no longer accepted. Um, this one here, so any um, so long life or a lot of um, alternative milk packaging, um, even if you get your, um, your fresh milk in a carton, keep it in the fridge, any of this kind of packaging that's mostly cardboard but it's designed to hold liquid it means it's got a plastic or a wax coating on it and we don't actually have facilities in Australia that can separate out the plastic from the cardboard and the wax some of them have foil layers in them as well so this one comes as a bit of a shock to a lot of people that anything that's been used to hold liquid that's mostly cardboard can no longer go in your recycle bin so it might be that you notice your um, using a lot of products that suddenly the packaging needs to go into the landfill bin, maybe it's a time to have a look at other ways you can source those products so that you're not getting that packaging anymore that can't be recycled. Um, coffee cups are another one. So similar, mostly cardboard, but again, has a um, plastic or a wax lining in it that we can't separate out the plastic or the wax from the paper or cardboard. So unfortunately, coffee cups need to go into the recycle bin. Um, these are one of those things that we probably shouldn't even need to worry about at all. It's much better if everyone remembers to take their keep cup um, and support those cafes that are um, really doing their best to make that an easy service for you to take your own cup. They're doing a really good job. Um, a couple of other no's, a couple of plastic lids here. So coffee cup lids. Um, this one here is the number six plastic. So um, until about Christmas last year, we were saying, yeah, you can put coffee cup lids, take it off the cup, put your coffee cup lid into your recycle bin, that's okay. Now that we can only take the plastics one to five, I haven't seen any coffee cup lids that fit into that category. So they go into your landfill bin, and again, another case for avoiding these um, disposable products in the first place and remembering them. Um, this little guy here, just a little uh, milk bottle lid. Um, so they can't be recycled either. Um, like with the glass jar with the metal lid, the plastic milk bottle and the plastic lid are made from different materials. So they're both plastic, but two different kinds of plastic. So um, what, our, what Clean Away asks us to do is to get everyone to take the little lids off, put the main um, milk container into the recycling bin, and the little um, lid here can't be recycled. Um, that's because it's too small. So when, um, when our trucks arrive with our collection from Serco Shire of recycling, they get dropped onto the floor of the materials recovery facility. Um, then they get scooped up and put onto a conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt um, works through a whole range of different uh, machinery that sorts out each of the different materials. Unfortunately, the machinery that CleanAway use, um, the little lids slip through the gaps, so they can't actually be picked up with the other plastic. So that's why we can't accept the, the small plastic lids. Um, there are some community groups and schools that do collect them though. So again, um, definitely worth trying to keep them out of landfill and trying to find someone that can take them and recycle them outside of the recycle bin. Um, 
One of the reasons is um, if you can imagine those being tipped in the collection, put on the conveyor belt and moved through all the different machinery. So um, paper and cardboard actually gets lifted out of the recycling with big fans. So these soft plastics are really light and they often get swept into the collection of paper and cardboard. And then that becomes a contaminant. So it reduces the value of that paper and cardboard um, when it's bailed up. So we can't take the soft plastics. Um, the old shopping bags are uh, also uh, quite notorious for getting tangled around the machinery at sorting facilities as well. So definitely no soft plastics in your recycling bin. Um, they can be dropped to coals and woolly stores that have the red cycle and then they use them um, to make into uh, furniture and other um, other equipment through replast. So yeah, please do us a favour, keep your soft plastics out of your recycling bin, take them to Coles and Woolies if you can. If you can't do that, then they need to go into your landfill bin. And again, the message really is let's avoid everything we can in our landfill bin. It's a small bin for a reason, so let's make sure we're not putting too much in there. So things like beeswax wraps, or reusable containers, those types of things can be really good alternatives to having um, to use cling wrap or other types of soft plastic. Uh, this one more that's a little bit of a tricky one, so a um, drinking glass. If you break um, Pyrex, um, like casserole kind of dish or a drinking glass, these are actually made of different um, a different composition of glass compared to the glass bottles and jars that we're usually getting as food or drink packaging. So while the jars can go in your recycling bin, any broken household um, glasses or cooking cookingware can't go into your recycle bin. So that all goes into your landfill bin. All right. Um, and I guess, yeah, I really um, wanted to reinforce that recycling is really good. It's great if you've got more in your recycling bin than in your landfill bin. Um, but anything that's going in your recycling bin still involves having trucks driving around and collecting them from all of our houses and running big factories that sort all of the recycling and running big factories that process all of the materials into new things as well. So lots of carbon emissions there and um, yeah, lots of transport and, um, and unnecessary, I guess, impacts that we're making on the world. Um, if our recycling bins are full. So yeah, if you can, any way that you can re avoid any of that packaging that normally goes in recycling, then you're really um, helping, helping out as well. So um, for the next little, maybe five minutes, I will just run you through a couple of changes that are coming um, to our waste service. And I can see a few questions and chat, um, comments coming through the chat too. So I'll just run through these slides and then we'll get back to those questions. Thanks for um, adding those in. All right. Um, so hopefully you can all see the slide there. Griffin, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it there? Awesome, thank you. Um, so probably a lot of you, if you've got an interest in the environment and the way we manage waste in the Surf Coast Show, you've probably heard that a change is coming to your bins. So um, February 1 is going to be the date that we all start using four bins at our houses instead of three. So this is what uh, the new bin service is going to look like. Um, what's happening is that your recycling and landfill bin will be collected every second fortnight. So you've got less, less collection of landfill, which means more incentive to save on the things that are normally going to landfill. Um, and uh, really think about what you're bringing into your household and trying to avoid those things that are just junk that go to landfill. Um, so your recycling and landfill bin will be every second week, those will be collected. Every week, your organic bin, which um, in most townships in the Surf Coast Shire is just garden waste, 
Um, it's going to start accepting food waste as well. So this is something that we've been running in Anglesey um, for a couple of years now, and it's been really successful. Um, so James gave a bit of a rundown earlier about the reasons that we don't want organics or food type waste in our landfill bins. Um, Organic waste is a resource, it's not a waste. Um, so by getting people to take their food scraps, and firstly, we'd love you to do what James does. We'd love you to feed food scraps to the worms or put them into your compost or use them at home to improve your soil. We'd love you to keep doing that. Um, the benefits of um, adding food waste to your um, green waste bin uh, as you know, Coast, is that there's some items that you might not want to put into your worm farm or your compost bin, so things like lots of citrus or um, onion peelings. Um, you can include those in your green waste bin when we change to the new service in February. Um, things like hair, pet waste, you can put into your green waste bin as well. So um, yeah, you might find even though you might be a fantastic gardener and, and do a lot of that home composting, we want you to keep doing that. You still might find that there'll be things that, some food things that you put into your green waste bin as well. Even big bones um, and meat scraps, those kind of things are okay in your organic bin when we make the change in February as well. Uh, so that's a pretty exciting big change and yeah, we'd really like to thank all the Anglesey residents. If, if that's some of you guys that have been using this for a couple of years, you've really helped us put that in place and, and show how successful it can really be. Um, the other change is adding a fourth bin which will have a purple lid and that'll be for glass. So from the 1st of February, instead of putting any glass in your recycling bin, that's all gonna go just into your purple lid new glass bin, and it's gonna be collected every four weeks. So when we decided to introduce this, there were a few reasons why we landed on separating out glass from the recycling. Um, the main one is that glass um, breaks really easily, and a lot of bottles and jars are just not made from the same thickness of glass as they used to be. So they break even more easily than they did when the commingled system was first designed. So you can imagine, and you probably hear it when your um, bin is collected and dropped into the truck outside, you hear some of that glass smashing when it hits the truck, hits the inside of the truck. And then I said before that um, our collection trucks go to a recycling facility in Geelong and they drop the contents onto a big concrete floor. So you see glass smashing as that happens as well. So by taking glass out of the recycling and putting it just into a bin for glass, it gets handled differently. Um, and it means that that broken glass doesn't then um, uh, contaminate anything else in your recycling bin. So you can imagine how easily broken glass will get embedded into paper and cardboard or go into the metals or plastics as well and, um, and reduce the value of those materials too. So that's why we're taking out glass. Um, glass can be also really damaging on sorting equipment. So a lot of processors prefer not having it in there. Um, and it provides an opportunity for us to use that glass locally as well. So we can look at using it for road bases or local projects too. So um, yeah, a couple of benefits for taking out that glass. And it'll be all colours of glass and um, bottles and jars when that change comes into effect. Um, so we did have to delay the project. Um, we were planning to have all of your four bins in place and being in use in July this year, but COVID put that plan back. There was a lot of um, health and safety considerations and a lot of difficulty um, arising, I guess, in the way that we could communicate with the community and really help, help people understand what the change meant for them in their homes um, and just challenges with um, the safety of the contractors that we have delivering these bins as well. But we do have a whole shed full of purple littered bins in Freshwater Creek. So they're waiting to be rolled out. Um, that will happen. So you will hear a lot more about this project in the next few months. But what's happening is that the, everyone will have um, four bins in place to start in the week of February 1 next year. Um, in the lead up to that, December and January, you'll get your, um, your purple lid bin, you'll get kitchen caddy, which I'll show you a picture of in a sec, and you'll get the new waste calendar as well, so you'll know what your new schedule is.
So here um, is the other little kitchen bin, food scrap bin. This is exactly what each household will get delivered. Just a little six litre bin that sits on your kitchen bench or maybe under your sink. And the green bags there are made of cornstarch. They are compostable and they're completely optional to use. So you can put, put one inside as a liner, put your food inside and then put the whole bin and the whole bag and scraps into your green waste bin. Um, if you're already pretty seasoned and um, have an inside kitchen scraps caddy that you already use without liners, we'd love you not to use the liners as well. Um, really, they help take away some of the mess and smell factor for people that this is quite new to. And I'll just wrap up. So there's so much to know about waste. I'm sure there's lots of questions that we won't quite get to, but um, there's three easy ways that you can find out more about recycling and about the changes coming to the four bin system. Um, so you can go onto our website and have a navigate around there and find any info you need. There's info about e-waste as well and other types of recyclable materials that are accepted at our um, transfer stations. You can sign up to our waste and recycling e-newsletter um, or you can send us an email at info at surfcoast.vic.gov.au. And I think I've probably um, been talking for about the right amount of time. So um, I'll, I might let you guys, um, Griffin or team, let me know if you want me to answer any questions or maybe you want to keep moving on. Yeah, so you've got about three more minutes, but yeah, you could probably look in at the questions and answer some if you want. Um, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, are there any that really stood out to you guys that... Maybe something about polystyrene and where that goes? Yeah, good one. Um, so polystyrene can't be recycled. It can't go into your yellow lid bin. Um, it is free to take to our transfer stations though. So in um, Anglesey, Lawn and Winchelsea, if you've got like a new fridge or something like that and got lots of polystyrene, you can take that um, and drop it off. And it actually gets recycled um, in Geelong at GDP. Um, which is a, um, uh, a local employer that takes a lot of these kind of random um, recyclable items and um, yeah, is able to recycle them for us. So yeah, polystyrene, not in your yellow lid bin, take it to a transfer station and it will get recycled. There's also a question in there about coffee pods. Yep. Um, yeah, so the best thing, because a lot of them are plastic, I think some of them are metal these days. So if they're metal only, if they haven't got any other type of material stuck to them, um, if they're just metal, they can go into the recycle bin um, because in the sorting process, the magnets will pick those up before they fall through the cracks. If they're plastic or made of mixed materials, um, then you'll need to find a specific um, yeah, recycling outlet that can take those. So I know some businesses, I think someone's mentioned Mitre 10. Um, again, I think the best option is uh, try to get a pod machine, uh, try to get a coffee machine that doesn't use disposable pods. Um, use a coffee plunger or a stovetop or a machine that doesn't have the pods. Um, and I know there are some reusable metal pods that you can buy. Um, not sure where exactly from, but you can put your own coffee grinds into that. And again, you, you're then avoiding having to throw anything away from making your daily coffee. All right. Well, I'm going to jump in there, Sally. Thanks for that. There's a lot of positive feedback in the chat section there. Um, my name's Jesse. I'm also a part of this group. Next up, we got Doug Rolf. He's a local community member and renewable energy guru. I feel like the transfer to renewable energy is a vital step for us to take to become a more environmentally sustainable community. And Doug's gonna show us how we can do this whilst reducing our energy bills this weekend. So take it away, Doug. Cool, thanks, Jesse. Um, I've got a slideshow, so I'll start on that. Um, I'll start with the idea that uh, if you're just looking to reduce your energy bills and you don't care about the climate, um, you may not get as much as you think out of this. Um, but if you think that the climate is an issue, let me just click share screen. Um, if you think that the climate's an issue, then you are going to take action, just like if you thought a bushfire was an issue. This was like last week in California. Um, if you thought that was a threat, then you would take 
action. If you think climate change is a threat, then you'll take action. So, and if we can reduce our bills along the way, then that would be cool. Um, most people live in a house of some sort. And um, because we um, live fairly luxurious lives in the West, um, we uh, use a lot of energy and we consume water and food um, at quite a large amount compared to uh, some parts of the world. And we buy goods, we use a whole variety of types of transport and we use our money to do all that, but we also use our money for other stuff as well. So I'll probably spend most of my time talking about energy. And if I talk really fast, we might get to touch on some of the other ones um, as well. So um, when we look at energy, we're really talking about the energy we're using to do stuff and we can uh, in our houses or even in our vehicles, we can have passive systems, which sort of just sit there and by design just do stuff for us in terms of energy wise, or we can have active systems, which are really like fuel using, um, electricity using systems. So we'll briefly start with passive ones. Um, passive ones are really to do with whether we gain, um, get a gain or we, whether we're pushing away or rejecting energy from the sun. Um, and then also looking at our efficiency of how we do that. Um, the sun's pretty freakishly big. Uh, it's a massive amount of energy. Um, even the amount of energy falling on Australia would be enough to power the entire planet. Um, we, could, we could probably never use the amount of energy that's um, falling on the whole world. Uh, so it's a huge benefit to us um, unless we mismanage it. So if you have a house that's not well designed or, or a flat that's not well designed, it'll get really hot in summer because you haven't managed the gain. Um, and uh, if you get uh, a really, really cold house in winter, it's because you've rejected too much of the, the solar energy. We want to reverse that. We want to reject the, the heat from the sun in, um, in summer and we want to keep the heat from the sun in winter. Um, that would be the, the ideal anyway. So um, there's some pretty basic stuff. Um, some of this you guys probably would have learned at school and it's, um, it's some of it's sort of obvious. Um, if you have your building oriented the right way, um, then you will get you know, light in the right sort of windows. So you might have your kitchen or your living areas on the north side so they get good light during the day. That means you don't have to have your heater on as much. You don't have to have your lights on during the day. Uh, if your windows on the north side are large um, and you've got an eave, then you can get um, good warm some, uh, winter, win winter, I was going to say winter wind, winter sun um, coming in through your windows and warming the house during winter. And if the, the house was built right, when the sun um, is up during summer and it's higher in the sky, it won't come through those, those very same windows. So that means you've got your windows that are designed well. And um, that relates to your shading as well. If you um, have this the right combination of building orientation and window design and shading, then you can keep out the summer sun and let in the winter sun. Um, so you're gaining in winter and you're rejecting it in summer, exactly what we want to do. Um, so this works whether you're renting or, or owning or building or whatever you might be doing. If you're um, renting a property, um, you can choose properties um, based on their um, their building orientation and what the windows look like and if it's shading. If you're designing a property, you know, if you're um, lucky enough to be building a house, then maybe you would pick something that actually had well-designed windows and good eaves, maybe didn't have a black roof and black bricks and um, sort of the basic passive systems. Um, related to that is um, energy use, uh, like energy efficiency. So this is sort of more um, how well the building was put together. So we're, we're in an old farmhouse here and it's quite drafty. Um, so we're going around at the moment, we're doing a lot of draft sealing. So we're using this sort of stuff, which, which no James, it's, they're not white worms. Um, this is called, I only found out about this stuff a month or two ago. Uh, it's called um, foam beading or um, uh, foam rod and you can push it, there's different sizes. You can just push it into the gaps around your windows, uh, around your cupboards, if there's any drafty spots uh, in the house, you can just push that stuff in. It's cheap as anything. It's like 10 or $15 for 50 meters of it um, at your hardware store. And because um, it's not actually changing the building really, it's just pushing in a bit of foam, you can do it in a rental place and seal up some, um, some drafts and it works really well. 
um, you can look at insulation. Um, insulation is a very big deal. I mean, we know that day night, the temperature is going to go up and down. We want the temperature inside to sort of stay a lot more even. And it's the insulation is really what gives us that separation from the outdoor temperature swings to the, from the indoor temperature calm that we want. Um, so there's lots of different types of insulation. I, I pulled this bit out of our roof um, just earlier today, and it's made of recycled plastic. Um, you can hand, you don't get itchy from it. It's, it's doesn't smell weird. It does, it's not dusty. Um, so there's lots of really um, uh, good quality, relatively cheap insulation that you can get. Again, you can buy this at hardware stores or specialty places and having good insulation in the property um, makes all the difference. If you're in a rental place uh, and you know it's got poor insulation, it's worth talking to your landlord and just say, look, can we do something about this? Um, even if it means sharing the cost of how to do it. Um, another big one with increasing your energy uh, efficiency of um, your energy use at home is about turning off unused appliances. I mean, it's the obvious things like turning off lights that you're not using, but this is more the um, uh, anything that's got a remote control on it or anything that has a little clock sitting there like your microwave saying this is the time you know it's telling you the time at three o'clock in the morning on your microwave you don't really need that um, so you can switch off those appliances uh, your tv your home stereo system your computer stuff a lot of that will just be sitting there using small amounts of power but it does it 24 7 and um, in a lot of cases um, that power use can add up to more than what it costs you to buy that appliance, just in its electricity use. Um, one cool duva that, um, I've got a couple of these at home, called, this one's called an Eco Switch, but there's lots of different brands and types. And you say, it's basically a, like an extension cord, but it's got an extra switch in it and uh, on a cable. So you can, you know, if you can't get down behind the telly to reach the power point, you can put one of those on and put the switch a bit closer to where you want and then when you finish watching your telly and you turn it off with a remote you just flick that switch as well and then it's totally off and it won't be drawing power all night so they're pretty simple uh pretty simple tricks these things cost about 20 bucks so, you know and similar things cost about the same and um you will find depending on the devices you're switching off like it's safe it's your your telly and your stereo system and whatever the amount of power that will use over the course of a year will probably be more than what um, the cost of buying that switch would have been. Um, it, it, it mounts up quite quickly. Uh, a really good, as I go through, I'll have a couple of, you know, websites and stuff I'll suggest, but um, a really good one is this yourhome.gov.au um, website. Um, it is a, uh, it's a government website, but not like Labor Party, Liberal Party type government. It's, it's, um, the people who know what's going on. <laughs> um, it's independent advice um, that has come out of a whole range of experts um, being put together and it has info on all of this sort of stuff. So it has info on um, designing a house. It's got free house plans. It's got stuff about orientation and windows and energy and water and you name it, materials, you know, um, you know off-gassing from different types of materials and things like that. Um, so that's one useful resource, your, yourhome.gov.au. And it's all, it's all free info on there. Uh, now, active systems. So this is where, this is more like machines. This is not, not passive stuff like a window or a shade or a roof. Um, this is stuff that's doing things, using energy. Um, so when it comes to that, there's really, you've really got two options. You can choose to generate um, power locally, or you can sort of have choices about shifting where you get your energy from. Um, but we're sort of short on time, so I won't, I won't go a lot into um, the gas side of things, other than to say, if you're looking at new houses or if you've got the choice, um, get off gas. Um, from an environmental point of view, it is, not, um, it is not cleaner, and we know economically it's getting more expensive uh, as well. So it's not the cheap, clean fuel that it's often made out to be. Um, another good option um, for you, if you can't, uh, you say if you're in a rental or if for some reason your house can't take solar, um, you can get green power. That's what we're doing at the moment because our solar uh, system is still getting installed. And that means you pay a little bit more for your power, but you will be uh, carbon neutral for your electricity generation. Uh, it's an accredited, audited system. Um, it's checked by the government and it's it's totally legit. Sometimes there's a bit of doubt about 
um, that, but it's, I've been doing it for 15 years, 15 plus years, and it's, um, it's straight up good way to go 100% renewable um, in your energy generation. Uh, when we did it, we did some of the uh, energy efficiency things that meant our, our energy use went down, so our bill went down, and then we've got green power. So we ended up paying the same amount, um, but we were doing it with less, less of buying less electricity, but paying about the same amount. Anyway, you'll get it. Um, Okay, generating. So um, this means you can choose uh, renewables. You can choose to get your power um, either directly from something like a um, solar gardens, which are like small solar farms or large solar farms or wind farms. Uh, you can do that through green power. Some of them actually have direct schemes. So if you're a renter and you can't put solar panels on your roof, you can um, sign up to a solar garden scheme and um, buy power from them. Uh, but the really cool one is if you do have a roof and you can put solar on it, then you need to do it. It's not really any better time to do it. The amount of uh, government support, both from federal and Victorian government um, is a lot and it will um, pay for probably more than half of your system. And uh, in that case, it's um, yeah, no better time in a sense to do it. it sounds, sounds a bit corny. Um, I asked a, a reputable installer I know, you know, for sort of a five kilowatt system, which is sort of fairly typical. Some, some people get more and some people get less. Um, for good components, um, you're looking at about $3,000 after the rebase, which um, is a lot of money in one sense, but compared to some of our purchases like big TVs and whatnot, it's not actually that much money and it will pay itself off. Um, your new jet ski or your new <laughs> widescreen TV um, will never pay itself off, but the solar will. Um, it'll reduce your bills. Um, the point about good components, um, don't, don't buy rubbish. Um, these, the, the electronics that comes with the solar systems often have a 10 year warranty. The solar panels usually have a 25 or more uh, year warranty. So you're talking about uh, stuff that will actually last a long time if you buy good stuff. And that's why I specifically asked him, if you buy good gear, yeah, all right, about 3,000 for five kilowatt system. That, that'll, on over the course of a year, would generate more power than the average house. Um, a list of uh, websites there. Um, Solovic is the one where you find about the Victorian uh, rebates. The Your Home website I mentioned before um, has a whole section on energy and you can find it, learn a lot of the terminology and ins and outs of this sort of stuff. Powered by Positive is the awesome Surf Coast Shire um, website that has information on getting solar, on energy efficiency, on local suppliers. Uh, if you haven't visited the Powered by Positive website, you really, really do need to do that. Um, the compare.energy.vic.gov.au website is um, a Victorian government initiative so people can compare their electricity bills as what it would be like with different suppliers and it makes it easy for you to change suppliers um, and it also makes it easy for you to investigate green power and solar quotes is a website where you can get um, quotes generated for you um, from supposedly local installers uh, I used this a year or two ago and um, with varying results um, some of the local installers were like from Melbourne and Bendigo. Um, but it did give me a good idea of what sort of system we might need and um, what sort of components were being suggested, the general idea of the costs. And it was a good starting point. But I, my biggest recommendation would be talk to your neighbours, anyone who's got solar, ask them um, who did it, how's it going, how much did it cost, what did they feel, you know, how are they finding it? Um, and you'll start to hear some names. We've got some very good local installers, um, both in Geelong and down the surf coast. Right, um, talking too long already. All right, um, now this one, it's important if you're trying to do anything with your energy that you you know where you're at, you know what, um, what you are using and where you're at. So we call that the usage data, sometimes it's called meter data. Um, your smart meter on the house or the flat will be telling the electricity supplier every half an hour how much energy is being used in that last half hour. And um, they're not always very quick to be able to tell you um, what that is. I know someone I was talking to just the other day who's been waiting two weeks to get that information back from their energy supplier. And I've said, just find another energy supplier. It's not that hard. Um, we'll talk briefly about blower door testing and thermal imaging too. So here's an example of 
um, some energy data. This is, I got this from my energy supplier yesterday, um, just straight off their website. You know, you just log in where you would normally go in and pay your bill or something like that. And they have a whole section on it. I can tell day by day, month by month, year by year, what we've been using. Um, we can see the effects of any change when we put solar on, hopefully in the next month or so, um, we hopefully see a big change in this. That, that knowledge, that information is really, really useful for, for working out if something's going right, something's going wrong. Um, there's other versions where, so this is a daily um, profile. So left to right is morning to, or, or the, the middle of the night through to the middle of the day. Uh, you can see the middle of the night, we don't use a lot of power, big bright yellow section in the, <laughs> in the morning when we get up and have showers and turn on the heaters and run the microwave and whatever. Um, bit of power in the middle of the day because we work from home, bit of power, a bit more little yellow splotches in the evening because we cook dinner, you know, maybe watch telly or something and then you go to bed and it all goes dark again. So you can actually see the the behavior, the energy use electricity wise in your house, very powerful, and very, very useful. Um, on the passive side, it's, it's difficult to automatically find out how your house is performing. Um, so um, two ways you can do that um, is blower door testing and thermal imaging. So I'll just mention these briefly because I did a course on this the other day and it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, blower door is a device that not many people have heard of. It's basically a really high tech, scientific gizmo fan highly calibrated that you um, get a technician comes and installs it into your door and they set it running and it puts it's like a controlled draft in the house so it pulls air out of the house um, and can measure exactly how much air is being pulled out and it'll tell you how drafty your house is exactly and there are Australian standards about that so that's one cool um, tool um, another one is thermal imaging so uh, this is you know uh, cameras that can see heat. So on the left, you're seeing heat that's um, leaking from a poorly insulated hot water service. And on the right, you're seeing um, some uh, poorly installed insulation. As you can see these insulation is missing. So on a hot day, the heat's coming down through the roof. And this area is uh, you know, in some spots about 10 degrees warmer than the rest of the roof. Um, and if you can combine those two together. You can use um, the drafts that are blowing during a blower door test and have a look around with a thermal camera and you can see the drafts because you see the cold air or the, or the hot air coming in. Um, right, and you can also get an energy assessor. Um, you pay for an expert to come in and um, uh, check out everything in the house, your, your appliances, your insulation, and they can do a full report and you can actually get an energy rating done on your house, but it, it does cost. Again, the Powered by Positive website is a really good place to start um, for looking for information on energy efficiency and for uh, local suppliers. Uh, also this book, Energy Freedom Home from Richard Keats has got some good general stuff. Now, um, maybe I'll get you guys to tell me, I probably need to stop there and take questions. Um, me yeah, then we, we have yeah, like two minutes for some questions, if you can answer some quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get rid of that. Cool. Uh, okay. Let's get my chat where I can see it. <laughs> so I'm working on too many screens. Okay, yeah. So um, Linda's saying she's using Green Power in the church. Um, oh, sorry, you, Green Power in Brunswick. Uh, it's been great catering style ovens and big gas pipes. Yeah, um, there's a lot of industry and commercial that are finding they can go from, uh, from gas to electric. Uh, there's actually very few industries now that can't go to pure electric from gas. The, I didn't mention before, the really good thing about going electric for your home or for your industry or your business is that the, the electricity grid is always getting cleaner. There's, there's more and more renewables coming onto the grid. So the grid gets cleaner. The gas grid never gets cleaner. Uh, and we know from all of the science that's telling us about um, climate change and our carbon budget, we have to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible. Um, that's, that's just not a question. So um, everything you can do to actually shift off a fossil fuel is a bonus. Um, and in the long run, it will be cleaner. And if you can do local generation through solar panels on your roof or whatever, it'll be, end up being cheaper as well. Um, Recommendations for solar on 3228, that's Anglesey, isn't it? Um, 
would be great if we can get a list. Okay, so it doesn't quite work like that, Fern. It's difficult to get a list. If you go to the Powered by Positive website, you can find a list of suppliers. Um, if you go to the Solar Quotes website, um, you can also find a list of suppliers. Everyone who's installing solar has to be accredited. Um, and there is a, I think it's the Clean Energy Council. I should have probably put that link in. Clean Energy Council has a list of accredited suppliers and you can search by map um, to find suppliers in your area. Um, I, could, I could reel off, but we've been asked not to sort of profile particular businesses or brands. Um, so I can't really reel off an, a list of names, but seriously talk to your neighbors, um, anyone with solar panels and ask them who did it. Um, there's probably a good half a dozen really, really reputable, um, not just reputable, expert um, solar installers in, in this area, in Surf Coast and, um, and in Geelong. Um, really. Uh, like um, yeah, sorry, Doug, but I think we'll have to move on. Thank you for that anyway. Absolutely. Uh, no so problem. I'm Jaya and I'm also part of this group. And next up we have Rustam Upton. Rustam is an environmental educator and is going to be talking to us about how we can help to protect and preserve our local nature areas and how simple this can be. Uh, I think this topic is important for all of us living in this region as the natural environment plays such a big part in what it means to live in this area. And um, I think it's important to know how to protect and give back to what makes where we live so special. So over to Rustin. Thank you, that's better. Um, yeah, thank you. Is it still saying I'm, you can hear me, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Jaya, for that um, great introduction. And, and yeah, thank you to uh, Surf Coast uh, Youth for Climate Group for um, inviting me uh, here and, and putting on the night. It's been fantastic. I've been uh, uh, learning quite a, uh, a few things already. It's good to know that um, you can recycle the um, those biscuit holders. Um, it's quite a point of contention in, um, in my house. Um, so I've got a PowerPoint that I'll share um, with you all. Um, can you, is that come up well, Joe? Give us a thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah, that's all good. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about, yeah, it, um, as Joe perfectly um, said, where, where, where we live, uh, down here on the coast is is such a beautiful place to look after. So why should we look after it? I'll sort of touch on that, but I want to sort of talk about some of the things that we can do, some um, particularly some uh, um, app-based uh, stuff we can do, citizen science, which um, can be uh, really, so I'm just trying to reduce, there we go, um, which, yeah, can be quite a bit of fun to do and quite educational as well, dare, dare I say that word so yeah um we all live down here um well I'm, I'm assuming most of us live down here in um a coastal environment i'm myself i'm in in ocean grove not too dissimilar to areas on the surf coast and you might have come across this term of fragile coastal environments are fragile and and indeed they are and there's um a number of reasons uh for that why we could say that they're fragile for one thing, sand dunes, which uh, make up a, a big part of what we think of as the coast, they're of course made of sand. And sand can be yeah, pretty easily moved by, by wind or even uh, heavy rain. And of course, of course, also many feet as well. So it can, it can, if it's not uh, sort of kept in place in some way, then it will move around really quite quickly. And then suddenly we might not actually have any sand dunes or big, you might have big holes in sand dunes that can then leave towns exposed to heavy winds and, um, and, um, and, and a lot of other things. So um, you, you need um, yeah, some dense vegetation to hold, hold that sand in place. So uh, that's often why yeah, we, we, um, we're often trying to look after the vegetation in, in sand dunes. Um, in the, the Surf Coast region, especially from uh, uh, Jan Jack down uh, through to uh, Anglesey and beyond, uh, there's quite a lot of cliffs. But those cliffs, they're, and I'm sure probably a, a number of you have, uh, have realised this, the, the rock of that cliff, really, of those cliffs, aren't, isn't incredibly strong. It's pretty crumbly and erosive. And I've gone into a little bit of detail 
uh, here, but you don't really need to memorize this. But um, like, though limestone is a pretty crumbly rock, it, erode, it, er it erodes pretty um, quickly. It's actually just made out of the remains of old sea creatures from um, a few million years ago. Uh, or it, cliffs are actually made out of old, old sand dunes, basically, that have turned to rock. And so they're not, they're not incredibly strong either. They're sort of pretty brittle. And actually, actually, quite a number of cliffs in our region are actually made up of sort of old clay and mud and, and sand, and they haven't actually properly turned to a really strong rock either. So um, they can, um, yeah, they can, they can fall apart pretty quickly and your coastlines can, it, it's already eroding due to wave action from the ocean. And so uh, uh, maybe if, if humans um, uh, uh, interact with the cliffs um, a bit too much, they can um, erode a lot more, a lot, erode a lot quicker than, uh, than we'd like. Um, our coastal environments also have a few creeks and rivers that um, come down and meet the sea. So Spring Creek runs through uh, uh, Torquay. This is the Spring Creek estuary here. And uh, there's the Anglesey River down in Anglesey. Um, and so, yeah, when, when a creek or river meets the sea, it's what we call um, an estuary. And there's also often wetlands that, um, that are present as well. And uh, a river a or a creek brings with it lots of nutrients because it's bringing all, all that sediment and nutrients from further up in its catchment. And, um, and so lots of nutrients means lots of organisms. So uh, estuaries and wetlands are really important uh, habitats and environments to have um, in, in a coastal environment. And there's, I've got just an example of uh, kind of how a, a food chain or a food, a food web works, just with there's algae feeding on the nutrients, shrimp feeding on the algae, fish feeding on the shrimp, and then say large birds like egrets, you may have seen egrets before, they're like large, quite tall white birds with really long necks. And they, they feed on um, fish or um, maybe really large crustaceans. So there's a whole heap of organisms, both tiny and quite large, that really um, rely on, uh, on creeks and rivers. Then of course there's um, beaches, which I think, I'll, most of us um, think of when we think of the coastal environment and rock platforms. And so like uh, rock pools, those sort of intertidal uh, rock platforms. And these are environments where people actually love to spend a lot of time. And then if we go just a little bit further inland, there's um, the hinterland woodlands and heaths, which particularly around the Torquay area are really quite scattered now and fragmented. And there's not many of those left at all. Um, luckily down the, the Anglesey, region there is uh, more of those. Um, but the thing about coastal environments is not only do a lot of uh, plants and animals like coastal environments, so do people. People love coming to the beaches. They love spending time in the surf. People, they also not only like, do they like to come down and, and visit, they also, after seeing what such a lovely um, place it is, they want to live um, near a coastal environment and start building lots and lots of houses. They'll also um, want to do fun things. So they want to get on their bikes and, and ride around the coastal areas. And also, they also love dogs. So they love to um, maybe walk their dogs on beaches or in other areas. So the thing about people, and, and I don't really have a problem with people. I, I quite like people. Some, some of my best friends are people. But if we, the problem with coastal environments and why we say um, they're so fragile is because definitely as um, particularly over the last say 40 years, more and more people have been coming to the coast, not only just as um, visitors, as uh, holiday makers, but also um, to live in these places. So um, because you know, our, our dunes can easily erode and our cliffs can easily erode and there's lots of um, uh, plants and animals living in these places, it's hard to find um, a balance and somehow we've got to find a balance and it's hard to maybe reason with um, a tree or an egret or a fish um, to about the fact that they've got to share um, their environment but we can reason with people and that's where that's where uh, we come in and and I reckon you, know, uh, you guys being a part of this group um, yeah you guys might um, want to uh, 
try to do a bit more to and and help um, maybe your your friends and family and, and community um, want to share the area a bit more. So you can see uh, here with this map, there's in terms of our coastal environments, this being a, a map of uh, of Torquay, um, but the habitat areas of the green bits or uh, well, the dark green bits, like where there's uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, say trees and and shrubs, etc. There's um, yeah, there's not a lot there in the township, and then even as you get out of town, it's um, mainly open paddocks, which for a lot of um, uh, for, for a lot of animals um, isn't the best habitat. So the best places are these denser parts along the coast here in the dune vegetation and perhaps along, along our creeks as well. And so there's not much at all and um, very small, very narrow. And if, um, if people want to also spend time in these habitats, well then, of course, the, uh, the plants and animals that live in these places, um, they're gonna have a pretty tough time. So us as humans have got to work out a way um, how we can enjoy these habitats, but not um, impinge on the um, um, on the survival of, um, of of the creatures and, and plants living in those places. So you're you're probably aware of some of these. Um, uh, well, particularly this guy here. I reckon some of you um, are familiar with the hooded plover. Um, so yeah, classified as vulnerable in Victoria. They think that there's only about uh, 500 uh, left in Victoria, but gradually been uh, decreasing. Now the hooded plover sort of doesn't make, make life easy for itself. Um, it only breeds on beaches or in dune blowouts, just really um, near a beach and ocean beaches at that. It doesn't really, you don't find them say in Port Phillip Bay, for example, they like the ocean beaches. Um, now the nests and eggs are, um, are really difficult to see, which is kind of good. Camouflage is good to um, protect them against predators, but it's also hard when a lot of humans are using a beach because humans will find them hard to see as well. And, and definitely um, destruction of eggs just from people uh, stepping on them uh, definitely does occur. Um, um, and nests and eggs, well, eggs do get eaten by, there are some predators, either the um, uh, introduced predators such as um, foxes, but there are natural predators as well, like uh, ravens or magpies or, or silver gulls will also eat the eggs. So they've got to deal with those natural predators, but then they've got to deal with all these humans um, uh, walking about everywhere with their dogs, which may not be on leads. Um, so yeah, just a lot more pressure. now. Um, the adults and the chicks also, they need, they need to get to the water's edge to feed because they feed on tiny little organisms that come up at the, the wave's edge um, when the waves have deposits, um, you yeah, have small organisms um, just at the, at the tidal edge. And so the birds, both the adults and the chicks, and you can see the chicks are absolutely tiny. Now, hooded plovers are only about the size, I don't know whether you can see my uh, teacup here, they're probably just about the size of that. Um, and so the chick would probably be about half the size or even a third the size of this, of this cup. So they're not very big at all. Now they need to get down to the water's edge. And if they're, um, often they're up at the, the, um, at the top of the, of the beach, sort of trying to keep away from people and maybe keeping away um, from, um, from, from high tide as well, if it is a high tide, but they've, They've got to try to get down to the water's edge. And now if there's lots of uh, humans and with dogs um, on the beach, then it makes it um, a lot harder. And so often they might not get enough to eat and particularly the, um, the, the chicks, which need to be eating a lot in order to, to grow quickly in order to fledge. So be able to fly. And so that they're then better at getting away from, um, from predators. They have one of the worst chick survival rates in the world the hooded plover. And so that's why they're, they are um, regarded as, as, as vulnerable. Um, the, the adults, if they get to adulthood, they can actually survive for quite a long time. But their reproduction, they're just not producing many babies um, because of um, just the difficulty in doing that because their habitat exists right where a lot of humans love to go. So yeah, the biggest threats are disturbance from people and dogs, um, but all yeah, the destruction of their eggs and yes, the death of their chicks. Also, I'd um, like to introduce, so the hooded plover you might be sort of aware of as a, 
as a threatened species of the coast. But um, in particularly our dune environments, there is, we, we do have quite a lot of um, really little small sort of dainty plants. Orchids, some of you might have heard of orchids. This, this is actually um, a gnat orchid. Uh, so you can see by the size of the leaves how big the orchid actually is. They have a little round leaf and then this is their flowering part. And they're really, really pretty little plants. But there's a whole heap of different types of orchids that, that you can find not only in the dunes, but also in our woodland areas. Um, now, yeah, they're really important for our dune environment because they actually, for one thing, actually help cover the, the sandy surface of the dunes, so reduce sort of um, erosion. But they also have really complex relationships with other, other organisms that, that live um, in the dune ecosystems, like insects and fungi. So they're really important for biodiversity. And the more, basically, the more living things you have in an ecosystem, the stronger that ecosystem will be, the more functional it will be. If you start removing lots of things from an ecosystem, that ecosystem's not going to become as strong and the whole thing could fall flat on its face. Um, now, things like um, orchids and a number of other small wildflowers, they're really sensitive to trampling and, and foot traffic. So that's you know, one reason why we don't want to be um, walking through um, all sorts of parts of the dunes. Uh, down in Ocean Grove where I lived, there was a, a small patch of these um, quite close to Ocean Grove Township and it was the last patch of these gnat orchids apparently in just that area near Ocean Grove. And unfortunately it was actually living in a lovely little sort of um, dip in the dunes and a great place for a dune party. And there was a dune party held right on top of um, this patch of orchids and they're destroyed. And so they're not really found sort of close to town anymore. You have to go um, further away to find them. So, um, and of course the people having that dune party would have had no idea um, that they were destroying um, the last little colony of these orchids. So yeah, things we can do. And I don't want to sort of sound too, too preachy on, on this slide. I, I, I wasn't able to spend a huge amount of time on this slide, but one of the first things is to consider our actions. So of, of what we do and where we go um, when we're down at the beach or sort of a, a, around in, in coastal areas. So remember that the tracks that are there in the coastal areas that go through the dunes, that take you from the car park to, to the beach, or they might um, run, a, run along the top of the cliff, they're, they've been actually designed and made for high use traffic. They've been designed for people. Um, and, and they're there almost as a bit of a sacrifice. So yes, they've, they have been made through um, a, a, a vegetation habitat, through a bit of um, bushland or, or dune vegetation, but that's sort of been sacrificed. So people can actually walk through that area. And you know, when you're walking through on these tracks, then you can stop and you can look at plants um, on the side of a track and look for birds and, and do whatever and, in, and just enjoy um, the, the dune or cliff ecosystem without sort of damaging the rest of it. So that's why tracks are there. And, and that's why there's not tracks all through everywhere um, because we're trying to keep, we're actually trying to protect a lot of it. Um, and also, yeah, remember that off limits areas are actually protecting something. And so when there's perhaps a, a, um, an area of beach has been um, roped off because um, hooded plovers uh, are, are nesting there, you know, there's, that's, it, it's up to you to decide whether that's important. But I'd like to think that a lot of you would find that that's important, that the hooded plovers have as much right as anyone else to, to bring up their chicks. So um, yeah, you, but, but, but it's up to you. It's all about our personal choice. And remember um, that signage is there to, to inform. So if you get a chance, you know, do read the signs because there may actually be stuff that you might find that, that might actually be um, quite important in terms of um, um, whether hooded plovers are nesting somewhere or not. Um, there's acting with your community, things that we can do. You, there's actually um, maybe getting out with a group and actually doing some planting. And there's a number of local groups around. There's Janja Coast Action, there's Anger, um, and um, you can probably get um, the details of um, we, through Facebook or, or through Council. But what I want to talk to you about is citizen science. So that's actually um, 
citizen science, if you haven't heard of it, is basically ordinary members of the public like you and me actually being able to um, record stuff, record, collect data that can actually be used for, um, for, um, by scientists and by land managers. So um, I'm going to take you through four different um, citizen science um, um, programs. They're all um, using apps. So there's uh, iNaturalist, which is a fantastic one, which is uh, all you need to do is take a photo of anything. It can be a bird, plant, it can be an insect, fungi, um, and then you upload it to, um, to iNaturalist. And you can provide a name if you know it, if you, if you think you actually know what, what species it is, you can provide that, but you don't need to do that because there's, actually, there's all these um, experts who are a part of the iNaturalist community and they'll see your photo and they'll actually um, identify it for you. And, and that's great because you know, then you actually get to find out what it is. Um, but your record will then actually be placed on a, a, on a national database, the, the Atlas of Living Australia, um, which is then accessed by scientists and land managers. Um, they can, people from all around Australia can see the data that you're, you're putting in. So um, that's, that's a great one to use. And it's really good for particularly things like insects and, 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 and fungi because they're, they can be sometimes quite hard to try to actually work out and books what things are. The next one is um, a program called Climate Watch, which is about um, getting records of just particular species. So they actually nominate um, what species they want you to try to find um, in, the, um, in, in the landscape. And they, they provide you a, um, an, an identification, um, there's an identification um, aspect to their, um, their app. Um, which you can try to identify. But some things are quite simple, like magpies. And what they want you to do is take a photo of it, but also tell them what is their behavior? What, what are they, they doing? Particularly in terms of, are they breeding? So are they nesting? Or if it's a plant, is it flowering or is it fruiting? Um, and then you upload this to, to Climate Watch. And what Climate Watch is actually doing. They want they want to get yeah, these records of these particular plants and animals, and so they can work out whether over time. So this will be a thing they'll be doing for years. Are these birds breeding earlier or later, or are these plants flowering earlier or later, or are these particular um, yeah insects or birds? Are they are they turning up um, from migration earlier or later? And so they can it's um, yeah so they can actually work out how climate change might be um, affecting our, our plants and animals. Another really good one is um, this Fluka post, which there's a few of these actually around in the, uh, in the Torquay um, Surf Coast area. And this is actually a map of where they are. You can go to the website and find out where these Fluka posts are. So what they are, it's just basically a post um, and you put your camera on it and it tells you where to place your, your camera or your phone and it even has kind of what angle to, to, to place it at. And sometimes there's actually a little um, picture here to show you what you should be taking a photo of. Or if you've got the app, it will actually, there's a transparency that will help you line up the photo. And so what you're doing by taking a photo on that post, looking in a particular way, you're taking a photo, often it might be of a bushland area or a revegetation area, or maybe a cliff face or a, or a river or, or it can be anything, um, but uh, so scientists and land managers, particularly land managers, can then look at these photos from the same post over time, and hopefully, you know, if you're going back there, say every month, and other people are going back there, they get this whole line of photos, um, which can actually tell them how that place might be changing um, over time, which can be really valuable. Now, some of these places, some um, are in quite remote areas, uh, well, we're in quite public areas, but some of them are quite remote as well, which um, can be really useful because it's, you know, it's not somewhere where, say, like a park ranger can get to all the time. But if he's got, if there's people doing bushwalks through an area, he can get them, you know, it's, and they're using these fluker posts, um, then he's getting, they're, they're getting these images um, come through and they can um, work out what's happening in place. Now, and the last one is, um, um, the Aussie Birds in Backyards count, which um, occurs only over a week in October. So this is coming up um, this October. 
and it asks you to do, again, you download an app, and it asks you to undertake a 20 minute bird survey um, anywhere. You can do it in your backyard, but you can go to the local park or, or anywhere. And recording the species and species of number and, and the numbers, um, recording species, yeah, and the number of um, whichever species of, of bird it is. Now you might go, well, I don't know, I don't know my, my sparrow from a starling, but the, the app will actually help with your identification it's got a really good key where you can it asks is it a tiny bird is it a small bird does it have black markings does it have yellow markings and um, through process of identification you can um, elimination you can identify the bird and then um, yeah put it into into your survey um, often say in an urban area like Torquay or in urban Anglesey um, you, you'll often be seeing quite sort of common birds as well. So they might be a little bit easier to identify. A lot of you might have seen this little guy, um, a New Holland honey eater, which are quite common um, in probably a lot of our backyards. And this guy with the, um, with the punk hairdo, the, uh, the crested pigeon, these, um, these are quite uh, common as well um, in our area, particularly say on, um, on sports grounds and, and more open areas. Um, so uh, yeah, you can do as many um, surveys as you would like during the week. And it's just a great way to introduce yourself to, um, to bird watching. And, um, and, and then your records actually become useful because the data that you're collecting is then taken up by um, BirdLife Australia, who are sort of the, the specialist bird group in Australia. And, um, and their, their, their data is used by scientists and land managers as well to um, manage all those things. So, so I've gone probably slightly over time, but um, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me and yeah, um, any questions? I think we might have some, um, in time for maybe just one or answering one or two questions. Um, yeah, maybe just one question for tonight. No worries. Um, what, Let's have a look at the hooded plover one. What time of day um, do the hooded plovers go down? I, well, pretty much um, the off limits should include. Yeah, well, I believe with um, when uh, we do have uh, plovers uh, breeding, um, a lot, um, what a lot of uh, land managers do, so in the Torquay area, it should be the Great Ocean Road um, Committee. Um, I believe they do sometimes fence off, um, off, off air, off a whole, whole beach if, um, if the parents need to be taking the chicks down to the water's edge to, uh, to feed. So um, I'm unsure, I, I know then um, up here in Ocean Grove, it, it does happen, areas of beach get closed off. And so um, possibly in Torquay, though I'm unsure whether they breed much actually near the town of Torquay, but Point Road Night at, Angle, at Anglesey is a common breeding place for, uh, for hooded plover. And so, yeah, it's just really important to decide whether you want to get annoyed by having that area of beach um, fenced off or whether you would like to go, no, that's cool. I, I reckon the, the hooded plover um, should be looking after its chicks and it's only Really, it only takes um, a few weeks um, for them to get them to fledging. So, um, yeah, it's up to you, but I'd really recommend for, yeah, I'd advise to maybe look on the side of a hooded plover, particularly when um, there's, they've been impacted so much with humans. So, yeah, and they go down to, to feed, I think, pretty much all through the day. They've got to be eating all the time, particularly the chicks, because um, yeah, they, they need to grow. Um, thank you, Rustin, for that. So we'd like to thank our presenters for their time tonight and all the work they did in our local community and all our listeners for their time and questions. We really appreciate it. And we'll answer any missed or extra questions on our Facebook, Surf Coast Youth, Youth for Climate. Uh, we hope we've given you some inspiration to reassess what you currently do around your home and what small changes you could make to reduce your carbon footprint. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a good night.
Well done to this amazing group of young people that have organised this event from start to finish. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Bye. Can I ask a question of the um, organisers, please? Sure. Hi, I I'm living now in Aries Inlet. Uh, my name's Linda. And um, I was wondering if you um, were organising anything on Friday for the school strike for climate and if you wanted any help from a, a long-term protester. <laughs> a non-violent direct action type. There are several of us in the community who would be prepared to help you. Yeah, I'm sure we could probably get in contact with you or something around that. Because I, I know myself, I was quite keen to do something, but never got around to organising it. So hopefully we could yeah, do something. Yeah, a few of us have been talking about that, getting something going. It's kind of snuck up though. Yeah, because I tell you, a, a few months ago, in front of, um, opposite the um, shops at Aries, we had a socially distanced um, Black Lives Matter and Refugee Lives Matter kind of protest. And we got a lot of support from passing motorists just by standing there with signs. So... Um, I, I ha I'm, I'm involved now that I'm, I've been down here full time since the middle of March. And um, I'm, I've, I've got involved with the Uniting Church people down here who've, um, who've got a strong social justice, um, shall we say. And um, we, we, we know from the SS4C website that they're okay with people who aren't students uh, doing something as long as we dress in yellow and register and all this sort of thing but we'd obviously prefer to do something which you young people would like to do and support you so shall I put my mobile number in the chat and you get back to me yeah do that do that yeah. and also we'll try keep you up to date on the Facebook page as well yeah um, yeah I think the best way is to Follow these guys on Facebook. Um, you have to friend me though, don't you? You have to allow me to be a friend. The group can allow you to be friends, or you can follow um, Surf Coast Youth, Youth on Instagram, which um, will post all of the things that these guys are doing. Um, and they, as individuals with their parents, can decide if they want to participate in um, yeah. any protests and things like that coming up. What's well, just. Um, violent direct action sort of stuff like absolutely and, and 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 that and um we've done a bit of it over the years um very very safely please be assured i just put my number in zero four zero five four seven zero five six eight linda Thank you so much, Linda. And thanks for tuning in um, early as well. I noticed you were early. Uh, and thanks to everyone else who has tuned in and to our presenters. Um, we will let these guys go now and get ready for um, their Mondays. But we'll talk to um, anyone who connects with us on Facebook or Instagram soon. So um, thanks very much and to the presenters. Um, we'll talk to you Tuesday if you're available. I'll, I'll be in touch. All right. You. Thanks, Apes, everyone. Have a good night. Thank Great you. Great work, guys. See you.